I've got my volume down too low, turn that up so I can hear you. Excellent, that means you get to talk. Excellent, all right. So for the last time, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, this is Thursday, May 6, 2021, and this is our last lecture. Uh, we are gonna finish off our autonomic nervous system. And I think that's all we'll worry about for this exam. I know there was some talk about possibly getting- My hair's down. I'm sorry? I look like a lady. <laughs> I look like a lady. Okay, uh, not sure what all that was about, but we'll go ahead and uh, mute everybody's uh, microphones for now, and then they can feel free to unmute them if they have uh, more to add. But uh, as I mentioned, there was some talk about possibly getting to the sensory stuff, but uh, I don't think uh, with the timing and everything else that's going on and the amount of material we've covered, I think we won't worry about it. It's much more important to make sure we understand this autonomic stuff, because as I said, this is stuff we are going to be uh, definitely using moving forward <clears throat> into 431. Uh, today's lecture shouldn't take the whole day. It depends on uh, how long uh, it takes us to get our way through these sympathetic pathways that I threatened you with at the end of last class. Uh, but I'm hoping there should be an opportunity for uh, a question and answer review, both either on the upcoming exams or on the final exam. So if you have any questions, you can ask those. And then it's all tests. Uh, Tuesday, uh, May 11th, I have a lab and lecture exam. Uh, again, you've taken four of those already. You know what to expect from that, so there shouldn't be any surprises on that. Thursday the 13th, we do not have class. I will make myself available both in my normal office hours, and I'll also be here for the first two hours of what would normally be our class time, so that if you have any questions, I'm not going to do a formal review because formal reviews for the cumulative final exams are kind of hard to do because there's so much information. But if there are questions that you have, that would be a perfect opportunity to, uh, to speak with me about that. And, and of course, I'm always good at responding to emails. And then on Tuesday, the 18th, you have your 100 point cumulative final exam. Again, 100 multiple choice questions. You'll have about 100 minutes to answer them. And uh, it should be all pretty simple and straightforward. All right, like I said before, I've said to you many times, uh, multiple choice questions almost by definition are tricky. I know some many of you don't like essay questions, but remember the magic of essay questions is partial credit. Uh, whereas with a multiple choice question, it's all or nothing. So if you misread one word, you misinterpret the question, they've got that trap answer there to catch you. So read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. Yes, Emily, you have a question. Yes, um, when it comes to the cumulative final and when it opens so would it open up like our regular exams like at 12 and then close at 4 30 or is there a specific time frame of when it's open when we need to do it and then close so yes it, no, i will it will be available during the entire class time uh you will have a little less than you'll have about two hours to complete it uh with all the checks and everything that go along with that but that's going to be it so again you can start it a little bit later you can start a little bit earlier uh, to get it done and out of the way, but it will be mostly available during the class time, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, excellent, then let's go ahead and get started. So I come to this slide quickly, but we will leave it just as quickly. Because as we were talking about last time, we were working our way through our, not three, but four sympathetic pathways that I've already told you I guarantee is going to be an essay question on the exam. Uh, so we left off last time, I exposed you to the first example of what this would be like, so you would know what to expect for something like that. Um, and then we will uh, go through the rest of them as well. Now to do this right, Again, I'm gonna do this on the drawing because we drew it last time. And so, uh, well, actually before we draw it, let's do this as a good review. Remind me again of uh, pathway one. What was the effector of pathway one? Since after all, you're not gonna be able to draw these on the exams, we should get used to writing these out. So what was the pathway, what was the effector of pathway one? Skin, excellent. So anything related to the skin. So if uh, the question says, what is the pathway that the sympathetic nervous system would use to innervate a pseudoriferous gland 
or the erector pili muscle or something along those lines, this would be the path that it would take. Excellent. How many neurons in the process, in the pathway? Two. Yeah, two neurons in the pathway. Excellent. What's the first one? The preganglionic neuron. Excellent. And what do we know about that preganglionic neuron? It's multipolar. And it comes from the, is it the lateral gray horn? Excellent. So it's cell body. You're absolutely right. Excellent. So we know it's got a multipolar neuron and that's exactly excellent area. That's where we're going next. When we talk about its axon, it is myelinated. And what are the structures? What is the pathway that that axon takes to where it synapses? Goes through the anterior. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. Anterior what? The anterior root. Excellent. Or ventral root. Remember, both of those are acceptable. Excellent. From there, where? Before the white ramus, you're right. It's going to go to the white ramus, but there's something in between the anterior root and the white ramus. What was that thing in between it? Well, remember, ventral ramus and, anter and anterior ramus are the same thing. What one structure do the two roots come together to form before they branch to the rami? I'm like totally blanking on that. Is it like the... Yep. It's so the dorsal spinal cord, and, central. It's not so much the spinal cord, but you're getting closer. Spinal what? Nerve. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. All right. So again, remember the dorsal root and the ventral root come together to form the spinal nerve. But then you're correct. The spinal nerve then immediately branches. And in this case, it branches to go through the white ramus. And of course, the right, the white ramus leads it to what structure? Is it the po postganglionic? Yep, it's go where it's going to synapse. But where is the cell body of that postganglionic neuron located? The chain ganglia. Chain ganglia. Excellent. And you're right, there is where it terminates, period. So it forms its synapse in the chain ganglion. Excellent. What neurotransmitter does it release? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. And I know I've written this out enough that I should be able to abbreviate it now, but since you're gonna have to on the exam, I'll go ahead and do it here. And what is the effect of that neurotransmitter? Excitation. Yeah. Excitation or excitatory. Excellent. Excellent. That is everything we need to know about our preganglionic neuron, our postganglionic neuron. Uh, let's try to be uh, similar. So, what is its structural classification? Also uh, multipolar. Yeah, also multipolar. Excellent. Oops. Its cell body is located in the chain ganglion. Excellent. All right. Perfect. Uh, what do we know about its axon? Unmyelinated. Excellent. And what is its path? To the effector. Yep, it's going to go to the effector, but how does it get there?
Excellent. It's going to go out the gray ramus. And once it goes the gray ramus, where does it go? Either dorsal or ventral ramus. Yeah. Bingo. Out the dorsal ventral ramus to one of the dermises of the, I mean, the dermatomes of the skin. Let's actually write that. Excellent. When it synapses on the effector, so form synapse. And again, I'm being more wordy, but I'm trying to uh, mirror what I did for both of these two neurons on the effector. Excellent. And what neurotransmitter is it going to release? Norepinephrine. Yep, most likely. And what about its effect? Inhibitor? Yeah, well, it depends, right? Absolutely. It depends on the effector. All right, depends on the effector. If, for instance, it's the blood vessel going to the adipose, that it's going to inhibit those so that they dilate. So more blood gets goes there to get the energy. However, if it's the blood vessels going to the skin, it's going to excite them, constrict them, right? It excites the erector pili muscle. It excites uh, the sweat glands, right? It totally depends on what the effector is as to what the sympathetic effect is going to be. Excellent. So here in words, uh, we described what we did with the illustration in the last one. All right, questions on that. What does the HC before chain ganglion mean? Uh, in the post gang, the first line of post ganglionic. Oh, I think I, I think what happened there is I started to write chain and CH backwards and tried to delete it. And I think I hit the minus button, which is right next to my space bar. So that just okay, that's good. 80 minus minus is just supposed to be, uh, was just a typo. I thought it was some abbreviation that I wasn't aware of. Nope. There. Excellent. Hopefully, uh, between what we did last time and what we've done right here, this makes some semblance of sense. All right, yes. sounds, of course, means yes. Excellent. Glad to hear that. So let's go back to the visualization of this like we did last time. Now, again, we are still going to put the effectors over here. And we still know that our first effector is the skin. Uh, the structures, I'll say it that way, of the skin. Uh, so that way it can be uh, pretty much anything. It can be the glands, it can be the erector pili muscle, it can be the adipose, the blood vessels, whatever it was for that. Excellent. So we've got our first of our four pathways uh, based on the effectors. And then of course we need to do all of our drawings again. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, starting first with our spinal cord, which we'll cheat and put most of the way off. We have our dorsal root, which honestly, we don't even really have to draw because as we know, uh, these are all motor pathways. So they're all gonna come out the inferior part of the, or the anterior part, I should say. But I guess the one advantage of having that dorsal root there is it helps us to remember that the ventral root and the dorsal root come together to form that spinal nerve. So it's useful for helping us to remember that. We then have, our four rami that branch off, dorsal ramus, ventral ramus, white ramus, and gray ramus, which we know goes to a chain ganglion. which we know, and again, my poor drawing skills can have an ascending to a different chain and a descending to a different chain, ganglion. 
And we also know that chain ganglia are not the only ganglia. We also have those collateral ganglia. So let's go ahead and put a collateral ganglia here in front of the spinal cord because we know they're also called prevertebral ganglia. And that will help us to make sense of that. So let's do that. And let's do that. And let's do that. And let's do that. All right, excellent. So this is the drawing pretty much that we had before. Let's go ahead and go back and label everything. Oh, wait, I lied. We need our gray matter of our spinal cord. Our dorsal root, our lateral root, uh, gray horn, and uh, anterior gray horn. So there we go. Off that way. Excellent. All right, now we can go through and label everything. So this, of course, is our dorsal root. I'm not going to bother labeling the dorsal root ganglion this time because we're not going to use it. And again, anywhere I put dorsal and ventral, we can also put anterior and posterior. So let's not forget that. Our spinal nerve right there. Our dorsal ramus. Our ventral ramus. Our white ramus. Gray ramus. Chain ganglia. So first chain ganglion, second chain ganglion. Third chain ganglion. Actually, now that I do that, sneak it up there. Excellent. Our ascending chain and our descending chain. Lastly, uh, put it up here, our collateral ganglion. Excellent. I think that is everything we need to have labeled for now. I'll put that there and because I'm nitpicky, I'll put that there. All right. Excellent. So a little extra time, but it got us where we needed to go. So this is again, our starting part point. And again, if we cheat and go back to the illustration from your textbook, this is what we see. Lateral gray horn in the spinal cord, dorsal root with the dorsal root ganglion, uh, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus, gray ramus. We see a chain ganglia with an ascending and descending branch, which there's has the nice three-dimensional look that mine didn't bother have. We have a collateral ganglia here in the front. We have most of the things that we have talked about and identified on this. Excellent. All right. So questions on that. There isn't any new information here right now, but I just want to make sure we are comfortable with this before we go any further. Wait, the chain ganglion on the bottom is um... Is it to the side of the chain ganglia or is it like you're pretending like it's 3D and it's going Remember, down? they're all parallel running alongside of this three-dimensional structure. I just lack the drawing skills to make it look that way. So I've got it drawn to the side, both the ascending and the descending one off to the side just because of my lack of drawing skills. But remember, they run parallel right alongside the edge of the spinal cord. So again, if we cheat and go back to the picture, notice this one on the picture over here, it actually shows 
two different segments of the spinal cord with their chain ganglia connected with that uh, ascending or descending chain in between them. So this is a three-dimensional structure and this is my poor example of how you would draw that three-dimensional structure. So that's all that is. It's supposed okay. to be straight in a line parallel and again, the reason I even have them there is to remind us uh, that these do ascend and descend. Remember, there's going to be elaborate branching. So as we saw, typically when, when a nerve leaves the spinal cord, and I'll just go ahead and draw this one here because I can erase it. When a nerve leaves, that preganglionic neuron leaves the spinal cord and comes to the chain ganglia, remember as we talked about, it has to branch elaborately because it's going to produce many synapses. So many of its branches will ascend multiple chains, many will descend multiple chains, right? Some will synapse right here. It's going to produce dozens, if not more, synapses, making these big, huge connections. But for our purposes, we're just looking at the immediate connection it could make uh, because it's simpler. <laughs> I, my, my drawing skills are truly amazing, except when it comes to three-dimensionality. I have no three-dimensionality. All right, excellent. Any other questions before we continue? All right, so we know the first possible effector of the four possible effectors. Uh, effectors that we could have. Is the skin, any of the structures associated with the skin? Nope, still too small. Oh, well. I don't think I can change that now. Nope, oh, well, doesn't matter. And we know they synapse in the chain ganglia. However, if you remember correctly, there was a second location that also involves synapsing inside of chain ganglia that our chain ganglia innervate. Our chain ganglia innervate the skin, but what were the other structures that our chain ganglia were capable of innervating? Anybody remember what else are chain ganglia? Well, true, yes, but uh, rector pili muscles are part of the skin. So I consider that part of the skin. So you're right, that is one of the things, but I consider that a structure of the skin. Is what it, the... Um, uh, what do you call it? Like organs in the, in the body cavity? True, but which organs? The internal organ of the Digestive. There we go. Internal organs above the diaphragm. Excellent. So our second possible destination, our second pathway is going to be uh, two organs above the diaphragm. Internal organs above the diaphragm. Excellent, right? So those are things like, for instance, uh, the, all the organs of the head, right? But that also could include the heart and the lungs. heart, lungs, esophagus, right? Things like that inside the thoracic cavity. Oops, we don't have heart, lungs, heart, lungs, blood vessels in the thoracic cavity, et cetera. So there are, if you remember correctly, two different types of organs. And the reason I distinguish them this way is because if you recall, there are specific ganglia associated with each of these. Which specific chain ganglia is ganglion, singular, is responsible for innervating the organs of the head? Superior cervical. Excellent. 
Excellent. And which specific ganglia, plural, are responsible for innervating uh, the heart, the lungs, and the other or internal organs of the thoracic cavity? Middle and uh, inferior cervical. Excellent. So in this case, if I give you a specific destination, like the heart, like your lacrimal gland, you should be able to tell me not just that it synapses in a chain ganglia, but you should be able to tell me specifically which chain ganglia. All right. Now, here's the good news. As we mentioned, these are synapsing in chain ganglia. And so when it comes to pathways, we already know the pathways. It starts with a preganglionic neuron. The cell body is where? The lateral gray root, horn, sorry. No worries, in the lateral gray horn. What is its structural classification? Multipolar. Excellent, so we have a multipolar cell body. Oh, lateral gray horn. It's axon, myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelinated. And what do you think the path that this axon is going to take is going to be? Out. Out, out what? Out the anterior gray horn through the ventral root to the white matter. Well, to the spinal the, nerve. Or the white ramus, spinal Excellent. nerve, white ramus. Excellent. And then what happens when it hits the chain ganglion? Then it synapses there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, either in the superior cervical or the middle inferior cervical, one of those cervical chain ganglia. Of course, as we know, what neurotransmitter does it release? Acetylcholine. And what is the effect of that acetylcholine? Excitatory. Excitatory. Oops, no, hold on. I do not want to do that. Excellent. Notice what the preganglionic neuron does in pathways one and pathways two are identical. The only thing that's going to be different about pathway two is you have to specify which ganglion. For this one up here, it could basically be any chain ganglion. Right? It depends on, oops, it depends on what part of the body you're trying to go to. So here it could be any chain ganglion, whereas for pathway two, we know specifically which ganglion this is going to be and would identify it as such. But here's where things are different. Where things are different start with the postganglionic neuron. Now, of course, there is some stuff we already know. We know that postganglionic neuron. Uh, is going to be, uh, what's its structural classification? Multipolar. Excellent, and we know its cell body is in the chain ganglion, or let's just go ahead and say cervical for now. We don't know which cervical, so we can put a little asterisk there. Cervical chain ganglion. Excellent. What do we know about its axon? 
unmyelinated, excellent. But now it needs to travel a different path. So again, we have this postganglionic neuron that is multipolar. The gray ramus takes us back to the surface of the body and we don't want to go there. So what happens is the axons from this postganglionic neuron form a new structure as they leave the chain ganglia. And as they leave the chain ganglia, this new structure they form is called the sympathetic nerve. And it is this sympathetic nerve that then travels to our effectors. Oops. All right, the organs of the head, the heart, the lungs, blood vessels of the thoracic cavity, and so on and so forth. And what neurotransmitter are they most likely going to release? Excellent. And I think I've written norepinephrine enough where I can cheat and abbreviate it. Uh, norepinephrine, and E. And of course, its effect, what's its effect going to be? Yeah, depends. Well, great question. Uh, again, it goes, so Danielle, the, the answer to your question is it, there are paths of this to all of them because our sympathetic nervous system has to affect our salivary glands. It has to affect the pupils of our eyes to dilate them, to let the sun light in, right? So we can see better. It has to go to the heart to make it beat faster. It has to go to the lungs to dilate them, to relax them so more air can get in. So it, all of these, there's not just one sympathetic nerve. There's not just one postganglionic neuron. We have thousands of postganglionic neurons that are all gonna go to all of these different effectors. But if I'm asking you for a pathway, you just have to give me the one. So if I say the lacrimal gland, if I say the salivary gland, if I say the heart, all right, there's going to be that postganglionic neuron. And of course, its effect depends. Like we said, if it's the heart, it excites the heart and the heart beats faster. If it's the lungs, it relaxes the smooth muscle so that they dilate so more air comes in. So it can be excitatory or inhibitory. Post so, so the postganglionic axon leaves the chain ganglia and forms a structure known as the sympathetic nerve. So whereas for path one, it went out the gray ramus to the dorsal and ventral ramus, here in path two, it goes out the sympathetic nerve. And really that's the only difference between pathways one and two where our postganglionic axon goes. Did I interrupt somebody? Was somebody gonna ask a question? No, I'm just trying to make sense of it. So you said the postganglionic leaves the chain ganglion to form the sympathetic nerve, which can go to the organs of the head or the hearts and lungs, et cetera. Great. Basically, yeah, to the okay. internal organs above the diaphragm, right? Okay. That's our second possible destination, the internal organs above the diaphragm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. All right. Excellent. Like I said, it only gets worse from here. So questions on this? Yes, Arthur. I'm just confused why a synapse would have to go like a level higher or lower. Uh, well, so uh, tell you what, let's cheat and do this. Notice here, you guys can see this. If yeah. you remember, if you remember correctly, we mentioned how in our chain, uh, in our sympathetic nervous system, all of the preganglionic neurons are located from T1 to L2. So notice anything that it wanted to innervate the head, by definition, has to ascend to be able to get up there 
and to have that effect. But remember also, and I'll go ahead and erase that, this one neuron isn't just gonna form one synapse. So it's going to be able to come out this way, or maybe it'll come down here and come out this way, or maybe it'll come you know, out to here and go to the skin. Remember these nerves form many, many broad elaborate connections. And they're not all gonna make those broad connections in just one ganglion. So they can both ascend and descend to have many, many connections, many, many effects. Because remember, with our sympathetic nervous system, we want big global effects. We want all of it happening together. So yes, what we're talking about are some general pathways, but it is much more sloppy than that. There's a lot of overlap on these systems. Yeah, we even saw a teeny bit of in this. Remember I mentioned how the superior cervical ganglion actually has a small input to the heart. So even that head one, the superior cervical chain ganglia, doesn't just go to the head. So big, elaborate, broad connections. So that's why there's that's why these things ascend and descend to go to different parts of the body. Big overlap, big global effect. All right. Great questions. What's next? Any other questions? Because again, like I said, just gets worse from here. So if this doesn't make sense, let me know now. All right, excellent. Then what we need to do is prepare ourselves for our third destination. Or we'll just give up. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so you can if you want. I mean, we're pretty far into the semester to do that, but uh, this is college. You're adults. Uh, I can't stop you if that is what you decide to do. Hopefully you won't, but because uh, it's not that bad. Get rid of that. Get rid of Come on. Why won't you go away? There we go. All right. And there. And there. <laughs> yep. All right. So on to our third possible destination. We've done basically all the superficial stuff of the arms and the limbs, uh, the front and the back of the body, the internal organs above the diaphragm. So of course, not surprisingly, our third possible destination is the internal organs that are below the diaphragm. Excellent. Now we know these are special because they synapse in the collateral or prevertebral ganglia. And remind me again, how many uh, collateral ganglia we have? Three. Three, what were they? Celiac, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric. Celiac, excellent. Superior mesenteric. And the inferior mesenteric. So we have these three different potential collateral chain ganglia. And as we talked about before, we know each one of them innervate different organs. So let's cheat and move these two out of the way. Come up here. What organs did we say were innervated by the celiac ganglion? Liver. What else? gallbladder. Excellent, because they always go hand in hand. Excellent. What else? The spleen. Excellent. What else? Stomach. Excellent. Pancreas. I can think of one more. Pancreas. Excellent. Excellent. So if I gave you a destination of the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, the stomach, the pancreas, one of those, then you knew it would have to synapse in the celiac ganglion. Excellent. 
What organs did we say were innervated by the superior mesenteric? Small intestine, excellent. And what else? Kidneys? No, not the kidneys. Proximal large intestine. Proximal large intestine, excellent. Excellent. Whereas the inferior mesenteric, what does it innervate? Excellent. So reproductive organs. All right, the testes, the ovaries, the penis, the vagina, all of that stuff. Excellent. All right. Uh, the rectum and anus or you could think of it as the distal part of the large intestine. Either of those are fine ways to think of that. And someone mentioned kidneys before, urinary, urinary organs. The kidneys, the ureter, the urethra, uh, the bladder, all of those are innervated by the inferior mesenteric artery. Uh, mis inferior mesenteric um, uh, ganglion. All right. So notice here on our on our illustration, I just labeled it as collateral ganglia. But when you're describing the pathway, you should be able to give me the specific name. Which of those three it is. If I so, if I tell you, give me the sympathetic pathway to the liver, you know it's celiac. Give me the sympathetic pathway to the testes, you know it's inferior mesenteric. Give me the sympathetic pathway to the small intestine, you know it's the superior mesenteric. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Oh, oh, can you remind me what the collateral ganglia was again? Uh, I, so the chain ganglia and the collateral ganglia are the two types of ganglia we find in the sympathetic nervous system. And I just realized I did not save that picture of them before. I wonder how far back the un undo will go. Let me see how far back I can go, see if I can save that picture. Perfect. We saved it. All right. Save that. And now I can get rid of all this stuff again. Well, you can do that, but it's easier for me to save the screenshot so that I can post it on the uh, website. Excellent. All right, spectacular. So we are on to path three and notice I erased most of that pathway, but not all of it. Because guess what? The beginning of our pathway for our preganglionic neuron starts the same way. So for path three, we still have a preganglionic neuron. It is still multipolar. Its axon is still myelinated, right? All of that is still true. All of that is still accurate. All of that is still correct. Its axon's path starts the same way, ventral root uh, to the spinal nerve, to the white ramus, to the chain ganglion. So it starts the same, 
But here is the big key difference. It does not synapse in the chain ganglia. So in this case, our preganglionic neuron does not synapse in the chain. Instead, it keeps on going and exits it without synapsing. Of course, when it exits it, it forms a new structure and that new structure leads to the collateral ganglion. where it will synapse. And this new structure that it forms is called the splanchnic nerve. Remember way back when we were talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, I mentioned how off of the sacral spinal cord, those axons form the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Well, in this case, the sympathetic forms the splanchnic nerves. So S for sympathetic, S for splanchnic, P for parasympathetic, P for pelvic splanchnic. And that is the difference between them. Both are myelinated axons. Both are made of preganglionic axons, but the splanchnic nerve is made of sympathetic ones. The pelvic splanchnic nerve is made of parasympathetic ones. So, one last thing we need to figure out for our uh, preganglionic neuron here. What neurotransmitter is it going to release? Serotonin. Excellent. And its effect? Serotonin. Excellent. Wait, so the preganglion, it leaves the chain ganglion and goes into the splenetic nerve, correct? Yep. Okay. So it never actually synapses in the chain. And so that myelinated, I guess I forgot to myelinate the one before, but it's all right. We, we wrote at least that it was myelinated, so that's important. So yeah, this myelinated axon continues on down through the white ramus into the chain and through the chain without synapsing. Until it finally gets to whichever of our three collateral ganglia we need it to get to where it will then finally synapse on our post-ganglionic neuron. It releases acetylcholine and that acetylcholine is excitatory. Now here, our post-ganglionic neuron, still multipolar. Its cell body is in the collateral ganglia. Its axon is, myelin is unmyelinated. All of that is true. And when it leaves the collateral ganglion to go to whatever effector it is going to be, Right, small intestine, large intestine, liver, spleen, gallbladder, whatever it is going to be, it leaves and it forms a structure that we call the sympathetic nerve. Well, didn't we call the other one the sympathetic nerve? Yeah, we did. So what's the difference? What is the difference between these two sympathetic nerves? Maybe there is no difference, just where they go? Yeah, pretty much. The first ones are above the diaphragm, going to the organs above the head. The second ones are below the diaphragm, going to the organs below the diaphragm. But other than that, it's just yet another sympathetic nerve. And to beat the dead horse, what neurotransmitter do they release? 
norepinephrine. And again, it can be either uh, excitatory or inhibitory, depending on the effector. Excellent. Questions on that? There you go. Excellent. Then just that easily. And before I start erasing it, I did save it this time. So we're all good. We have described the third possible pathway to our third set of effectors. All righty. Questions on that? All right. Well, then I have a big question. What the heck is our fourth possible destination? We've gone to every surface of our skin, to our arms and our legs. We've gone all the organs above the diaphragm, all the organs below the diaphragm. What the heck is left? Anyone know? Anyone cheat? Anyone look ahead? Adrenal gland. There you go. Remember, the one thing that the sympathetic nervous system does that our uh, parasympathetic doesn't is cause the adrenal gland to release all that adrenaline into our blood which again, maximizes that big, huge global effect. And so the fourth path we have to look to is to the adrenal gland and more specifically to the cortex, uh, pardon me, to the medulla of the adrenal gland. Of course, the adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney, so it's also sometimes referred to as the suprarenal gland. Uh, let's go ahead and draw it. We know here is the kidney. Whoops, no, let's do it this way. With a concave and a convex surface. And we know sitting on top of it is the adrenal gland. And yes, that's not drawn to scale. Uh, diaphragm is a skeletal muscle, and skeletal muscle is not controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Now, like many of the structures we've talked about in this class, and many more we will talk about in 431, our adrenal gland, which sits on top of the uh, kidney, has a chewy nougat center and a candy-coated shell. And when we have that type of uh, organization, what do we call the outer region again? What do we call the outer region of something? Cortex, there you go. Excellent. And then what do we call the inner region? Medulla. Medulla, excellent. Now, I don't want to actually write medulla inside there because I want room to draw inside of my medulla. So we will just put it out here and then draw a little line to remind us that that is the medulla. Excellent. So this is our goal, to get to the medulla of the adrenal gland. And because I like to cheat, if you've noticed, I haven't completely erased my preganglionic neuron because this path that we use for three 
is part of the path for four. So again, it starts the exact same way. We have a preganglionic neuron that's multipolar, whose cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. Looks like I didn't write that before, so I guess good thing I can write it now. Make it red and make it 14. Axon, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus, chain ganglia, does not synapse. Leaves splanchnic nerve. And travels to not just any ganglion, but specifically to the celiac ganglion where again, it does not synapse. Instead, that myelinated axon keeps on going, exits out, and goes directly to the medulla of the adrenal gland. Still needs to synapse on a postganglionic neuron. But in this case, the postganglionic neuron is actually inside the medulla of the adrenal gland. Now, of course, we know our preganglionic is going to release acetylcholine, and it is going to be excitatory. We know that is true. So let's talk about what this postganglionic neuron does. Our postganglionic neuron releases primarily epinephrine, about 80%, oops, not 80, and norepinephrine, about 20%, oops, that's not 20%, into the bloodstream. So this uh, postganglionic neuron basically releases its content into the blood, giving us that big, huge global stress response. And to be consistent then, this one synapses in the medulla of the adrenal gland. So here, not only do we describe the effectors, but we talked about where our preganglionic neurons actually synapse. So the first synapse and the second one are both in the medulla of the adrenal gland. No, there is no second synapse in this one. In this case, basically what's happening is those cells inside of the medulla are releasing the a neurotransmitter into the interstitial fluid and it gets into the blood supply and goes everywhere. So really the, gotcha. second, the second synapse is wherever that neurotransmitter lands, right? So once it gets into the blood, it could go anywhere. It could go to my eyeball, it could go to my toenail, it could go to my stomach, it could go to my spleen, it could go to anywhere in between. So pretty much at that point, it goes everywhere which is why we get that big global stress response. Okay, thank you. Yep, no, great question. Any others? 
Well, this normally affect our fight or flight response, right? Absolutely. And again, you've all experienced this. You just haven't thought of it in these terms because we are reaching the end of this class. We are reaching the final exam. So it is not uncommon for students much like yourselves to be sitting at a kitchen table at two o'clock in the morning in the dead of the night studying for this class. And while you're sitting there and it is super quiet in the house and everywhere else, bang, there's this loud noise outside, right? And you jump out of your skin thinking, oh my God, it's the police coming in or whatever it is, right? And then you just realize that it's just the neighbor's car backfiring. As soon as you realize it's the neighbor's car backfiring, you instantly know that you are okay. But does your heart rate instantly go back to normal after you get scared? No. No. And the reason it doesn't is because that scare has sent this signal to the adrenal gland and released adrenaline into the blood. And adrenaline being a hormone is a longer lasting chemical signal. So even though you know there's no danger and you're okay, your heart rate stays elevated for a prolonged period of time because it takes a little time to clear that adrenaline out of your blood. So it takes 15, 10, 20 minutes till finally your heart rate goes back to normal and everything's back to normal again. <laughs> Creepy stories to recover from a &P. <laughs> All right, so excellent. Preganglionic never synapses until it gets reaches to the medulla. And for okay. this fourth pathway, yes. Okay, so it just keeps on it keeps on not synapsing until it reaches the yeah. fourth. Pathway. Okay. Notice, and and you brought up a really really good point. Notice if you think about what we were talking about before. This sounds. like more of a parasympathetic pathway, right? If you think about it, our parasympathetic nervous system is the one that goes all the way to the effector and actually synapses just outside or actually inside the effector. So in some ways, it seems more like a parasympathetic pathway, a very long preganglionic neuron, very short postganglionic neuron. It's synapsing inside the effector. It's a different pathway than the others, which is why I think your book emphasizes those first three more, but as anyone who's ever been scared knows, this ability to release adrenaline is a hugely important sympathetic pathway. So we don't wanna forget about it as well. See, I'd, I'd make fun of you guys for doing those things, but I've done all those things. I've bungee jumped, I've skydived, I've done all those things. While you're young, now's the time to do it. So yeah, if you haven't, then uh, feel free. Although I will tell you, I skydived and I skydived once. And literally one week to the day after I skydived, I did a tandem with an individual. Uh, the individual that I did a tandem with was doing a tandem with a woman and their chute didn't open properly and they both died. And they found a large amount of marijuana in his system. So I have not been encouraged to go back skydiving since then. I did it my one time. I will not do it again. But yeah, bungee jump, I'll do that any day of the week. I don't have a good answer for you. Because it was there. All righty. Here are our four pathways. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So before we get too far down the rabbit hole of adrenaline, let's go ahead and take our first break, give this an opportunity to sink in. And now that we've done it with the illustrations, we'll go back and do it with the words. We'll think of it in terms of synapses. We'll think of it in terms of effectors. I, we will try to beat this dead horse as much as possible to make sure that you guys understand it and can make sense of it. So it looks like it is 105 now. I'll go ahead and leave this one up. Let's go ahead and take our, whoops, wrong button. Let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, we will make it a 15 minute break. So we will restart at 1.20. And I will start the recording at that time. All right, any questions on that? 
All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and go through this again. Again, uh, one of the things that we tried to emphasize as I was going through this the first time, and again, there are lots of ways to think about and process this information, is to think of these pathways in terms of where the synapses take place. So if you think about it, if you remember, uh, for our first pathway, our synapse took place in the sympathetic chain ganglion, right? We had that preganglionic neuron. It's multipolar. Its cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. It has a myelinated axon that leaves the ventral root to the spinal nerve. We don't want to forget that spinal nerve. But it then leaves that spinal nerve to form the white ramus, which is that lateral communicantes. From there, it synapses within that chain ganglia. And again, remember it can ascend or it can descend doing all of those things, but it's gonna synapse in that chain ganglia. It is going to release acetylcholine and that acetylcholine is always excitatory. Then our preganglionic neuron, whose cell body is located in that chain ganglia, has an unmyelinated axon that leaves the chain ganglia out of the gray ramus, becoming part of the dorsal and ventral root. Uh, pardon me, dorsal and ventral ramy. And once it becomes part of that dorsal or ventral ramy, where does this postganglionic neurons axon go? What ultimate effectors will this communicate with? The skin. skin. Yeah. Right? Basically, the blood vessels of the muscle and the skin. Um, Erector pili muscles, adipose, you know, sweat glands, all of that stuff that we talked about. Right. And again, front, back, and limbs. Let's not forget about those limbs. We've done this one three times now, so hopefully that makes some semblance of sense. And that's useful because as we also talked about, for our second pathway, it starts the exact same way. In fact, I can probably cheat and put most of these things back. Preganglionic neuron, multipolar neuron, myelinated axon, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus, where again, it can ascend or descend traveling up and down the chain. And it's going to release acetylcholine, which is excitatory. In fact, the entire pathway of the preganglionic neuron and everything that it does is exactly the same in these first two pathways. Literally no difference. In fact, the only two things that are different are where the axon of the postganglionic neuron goes. In this case, it leaves out that sympathetic nerve towards the thoracic cavity. And what are the effectors that are innervated by the sympathetic nerves? The internal organs above the diaphragm. There you go. Perfect. Salivary glands, mucous membranes of the nose, uh, smooth muscle of the eye, right? lacrimal glands, heart, lungs, esophagus, all of those things in those, uh, in those region from the diaphragm up internally. This is pathway two. Now, 
I like my visualizations. This one is nice. This one's not from your textbook, but it's a nice one that I like. The one point that I want to emphasize is notice they show both pathways. But uh, they show one pathway on the right and one pathway on the left. Is that how it works in the body? All the ones that go to the skin are on the right and all the ones that go to the organs of our body are on the left? No, of course not. That's not how it works. They're just using this as an illustration to show this. So notice in both of these pathways, the path of that preganglionic neuron is identical. Out from the lateral gray horn, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus, and synapse. Notice they show it can ascend or descend if we need it to. So that is all the same. The only thing that is different in these two pathways is what the postganglionic neurons axon does. It either goes out the gray ramus to the dorsal and ventral rami, where it would go to the spinal nerves, to the skin or to the arms and the legs, or its uh, unmyelinated axon leaves out that sympathetic nerve to basically go to the internal organs above the diaphragm. All right, so for this one again, we're emphasizing where the synapse takes place in that chain ganglion. Because as we know, it doesn't have to occur. Oh, here's the picture from your textbook that does a nice job of showing this as well. Notice again, it can show it ascending or descending, but in this case, again, it shows it going to the skin. Excellent. But as we know, it doesn't have to synapse in the chain ganglion. Instead, it can synapse in the collateral ganglion. The path starts the same way. Preganglionic neuron, cell body located in the lateral gray horn, multipolar, myelinated axon, out the ventral root, to the spinal nerve, through the white ramus, to the chain ganglia. But this time it does not synapse on the chain ganglion. Instead, it continues on without synapsing, forming our splanchnic nerve. Where it travels to one of our collateral ganglia, where it will synapse, releasing acetylcholine, being excitatory, and then that unmyelinated postganglionic axon leaves, again, forming a sympathetic nerve. And innervates the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Again, I use this picture because it's, even though it's not from your textbook, I like the way that it shows how the chain ganglia are paired to the side of the spinal cord, whereas the collateral ganglia is unpaired in the middle. And notice here, the two pathways are the same. Right. Ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus through the chain ganglion, out the splanchnic nerve to synapse in a collateral ganglia where then our postganglionic neuron forms that sympathetic nerve that is going to innervate the organs below the diaphragm. Again, no new information, just some different ways of visualizing it and seeing this. And as we just finished learning, there is a, oh, I, I love this picture from your textbook. They do a really nice job of showing uh, the pathway, but notice what our book does. It does hedge its bet, so I'm not too angry at it. Look how it says a collateral ganglion, such as the celiac ganglion. And it says a target organ, for example, the intestines. What's the problem with this? There's different parts of the intestine. 
Right. Well, for starters, absolutely. You do not have an organ that is an intestine. You have a large intestine or a small intestine. So they were inaccurate that way. But yeah, and that's absolutely 100% true and one of the problems. But there is a second problem. What's the, the second problem with this? The intestine is a su superior mesentery. Yeah. The celiac ganglion doesn't innervate the intestines. The superior mesenteric does the small intestine and most of the large intestine. The inferior mesenteric does a little bit of the large intestine, but the celiac doesn't do any of the intestines, of any type of intestine. So yeah, now again, they hedge their bet by saying such as and for example, but I still think it's uh, somewhat ironic that they picked unpaired ganglia and effectors for their example, but that's what you, happens when you have artists and anatomists and they're not the same. All right, excellent. Our fourth pathway, the medulla of the adrenal gland. And again, both are acceptable terms. You may call it the adrenal gland, that is fine. Uh, you may call it the suprarenal gland, that is fine. Either way, we need to get to the medulla of it. Notice once again, our path starts the same way. Preganglionic neuron, whose cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. It's multipolar, its axon is myelinated. It leaves the ventral root to the spinal nerve through the white ramus, does not synapse in the chain ganglia. Out that splanchnic nerve to the ciliac ganglion, where it does not synapse in that ciliac ganglion and instead travels all the way to the adrenal gland where it synapses in the medulla. And in the medulla, our postganglionic neuron then releases the hormones epinephrine about 80% and about 20% norepinephrine into the blood to affect everything. So and as I mentioned, your book doesn't have a nice illustration that shows that, but here's the pretty one from that other book that I like that does. So notice, lateral gray horn, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus through the chain ganglion, splanchnic nerve to the ciliac ganglion, don't synapse, finally synapsing in the medulla on that postganglionic neuron which releases hormones into the blood. Uh, so in the exam, as an essay question, you will give us an effector and we have to find a pathway. Yep, so the question will be uh, identify the sympathetic pathway, or identify the pathway that the sympathetic nervous system would use to innervate X, right? That's probably the easiest way to write it. Okay. And pretty much X can be anything from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. And you should be able to give me the pathway whether I say a lacrimal gland, whether I say an erector pili muscle, whether I say the spleen, whether I say the rectum, whether I say uh, the uh, adrenal medulla, you should be able to describe that pathway. Whatever X I give you, you should be able to describe that with details. Identifying the nerves, identifying the neurotransmitters they release, identifying any specific ganglia that you're responsible for. You should be able to do everything, all of that. And again, while your book doesn't have this picture, your book does do a nice job of showing some other ways of seeing this thing. And let's come back to this octopus. Because notice when we come back to this octopus, now that we have a little bit more sophistication, we can see just how good this it really is. Notice, as we've talked about, there are four pathways. Pathway one we'll do here in purple, starting in the lateral gray horn. Uh, that preganglionic neuron is going to basically leave out the ventral root, out the spinal nerve, out the white ramus to a chain ganglion, where we know it can ascend or descend. But it's going to synapse on a chain ganglion, 
when it synapses on that chain ganglion, that postganglionic axon goes out the gray ramus to the dorsal ramus to the ventral ramus to the skin. So there's our pathway one. Notice we also can start with a preganglionic neuron in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, out the ventral root, out the spinal nerve, out the white ramus to a chain ganglion where it can synapse right away or it can ascend or descend to one of the cervical ganglia. Notice if it goes to the middle or inferior cervical uh, chain ganglia, it can go to the organs of the heart, like the blood vessels, like the lungs. If it goes to the superior, it can go to the organs of the head, like the eyes, like the salivary glands. Pathway two. Pathway three. Notice it doesn't have to synapse in the chain ganglia. We can start in that preganglionic neuron with cell bodies located in the lateral gray horn, out the ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus to the chain ganglia, and as a red axon pass right on through to form splanchnic nerves to go and synapse on one of our three collateral ganglia. Once we synapse there, I've noticed I happen to pick the superior mesenteric. So that's gonna allow me to then innervate the small intestine or the proximal part of the large intestine, right? Inferior mesenteric allows me to go to the urinary system, to the reproductive organs, to the rectum. Celiac lets me go to the liver, gallbladder, stomach, spleen, pancreas. But notice also this illustration shows us our fourth pathway. Starting in the lateral gray horn, ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus, chain ganglia, do not synapse. Form a splanchnic nerve. Go to the celiac ganglion, do not synapse and travel all the way to the medulla of the adrenal gland where it synapses there. So while when we first looked at this scary looking octopus, it really does show us all the information that we have just finished talking about. It's actually a really excellent chart showing us all of these pathways and all of this information that we are responsible for. It takes us a little time to tease it out, but once we understand what we're doing and what we're looking at, we can figure it out pretty easily. All right. Questions on that? Again, lots of ways you can diagnose this information. Are we on time? We're doing good. Hold on, let me do one more thing. Actually, you know what? All right, so fine. Again, we can think of it uh, lots of different ways we can diagnose this information. One of them is to think about, all right, what happens to that preganglionic neuron when it reaches the chain ganglia, right? Ventral root, spinal nerve, white ramus. And once we get here, there's basically four things it can do. It can synapse right away. It can ascend or descend before it synapses. It can pass through without synapsing to synapse in a collateral ganglion, or it can pass right on through all of that stuff, not synapsing in the chain, not synapsing in the collateral and going to the medulla of the adrenal gland. Um, no, great question. Uh, the preganglionic neuron in this fourth pathway, the preganglionic does release acetylcholine, which stimulates the postganglionic neurons in there, and they're the ones that release the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. 
So yeah, so notice for all four pathways, no matter where that preganglionic neuron synapses, it always releases acetylcholine and it's always excitatory. Yep, great question. Again, your book's got some nice uh, charts that show this pathway as well. Again, remember we start easy. Everything is located just between T1 and L2 of the spinal cord. This is where all the preganglionic neurons are located. But notice our postganglionic neurons can either be in a chain ganglia, they can be in a collateral ganglia, or they can be in the medulla of the adrenal gland. If our preganglionic neurons, pardon me, our postganglionic neurons are located in a chain ganglia, then they innervate the limbs, the head, all the organs above the diaphragm. If they're in a collateral ganglia, they innervate the organs below the diaphragm. And of course, if they're in the medulla of the adrenal gland, they release that hormone into the blood and affect everything. Lastly, again, we can think of the final pathways, our spinal nerves, from the gray ramus, right? Dorsal ramus, ventral ramus, they go to the skin, the dermatomes, rectal pili muscles, blood vessels of the skin, blood vessels of the muscle, the back, the front, and the limbs. Sympathetic nerves from the chain ganglia go to the organs above the diaphragm. Splanchnic nerves go to the prevertebral ganglia, go to all the organs above the diaphragm and have that additional pathway to the adrenal gland. Again, just lots of different ways to beat this information to death, including one last way where, cause you guys are being all quiet, you are going to do for me. The other easy way, well, I don't know how easy it is, but we'll see how easy it is. The other effective way of being able to figure out what's going on here is to kind of start with our big hub. We have this big hub that is our chain ganglion. And if you think about it, with this chain ganglion, there is not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six different pathways into and out of our chain ganglia. This is a true super busy hub with lots of axons coming into it and coming out of it. So here is your job, your job for me, and I'll make a point of emphasizing this also could very easily be an essay question on the exam, your job for me is to first identify the pathway for the chain ganglia. So let's write this down. So we wanna identify the pathway, uh, the type of axons that form it. And of course we know what type of axons form it. We of course are also going to know if it's myelinated or unmyelinated. Also the direction they travel. Is it into or out of the ganglion? If it's into, where'd it come from? If it's out of, where's it going? Ouch. So let's do that. Six pathways into or out of the chain ganglia. Someone name one of them for me. The preganglionic? 
okay, those are one of the types of axons, but what would one of the structures be? If, we, if I had made you draw this chain ganglia and all the pathways into it and out of them, give me the name of one of the pathways into or out of the chain ganglia. The structure of the skin. Okay, so how would it get to the skin? It would come from the lateral brain horn of the spinal cord and into the white ramus, mm -hmm. where it releases the acetylcholine but does not synapse, but then goes right into the collateral ganglion. Close. So, okay, let's start with what you were just talking about here. You just identified one of the possible structures. One of the possible structures that feeds into or out of the chain ganglion is the white ramus. All right. So that was something that you said that absolutely is accurate. Excellent. So what type of axon forms the white ramus? Is it a preganglionic or postganglionic axon? Preganglionic. And because it's preganglionic, is it myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelinated. Excellent. Is it coming into the chain ganglion or out of the chain ganglion? It's going in. And if it's coming into the chain, where is it coming from? The spinal nerve. Okay, true, the spinal nerve. Or we could go back even further than that, as you guys mentioned earlier, the lateral gray horn. Right, that's where the cell body is located. The preganglionic neurons, the cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. So it started in the lateral gray horn uh, and it traveled in with that preganglionic myelinated axon into the chain. All right, so that's how the game is played. Give me another one. Five more structures coming into or out of the chain ganglion. Now, if you were able to give me the white ramus, what should be an easy one to think of next? Gray ramus. Excellent. And so does that mean it's myelinated or unmyelinated? Unmyelinated. Excellent. Uh, is it going into or out of the chain? Out of the chain. Oh. Going where? Uh, like the skin. Yeah. All right, we could put skin here. We could put uh, dorsal or ventral ramus, a dermatome, you know, something along those lines. Any of those would be an acceptable answer. Excellent. And so there you go. We've got that pathway coming out the chain. Give me another pathway of the chain. The, the sympathetic nerve. Excellent. I like that one. Let's do that one. Yep. Sympathetic nerve. Is the sympathetic nerve made up of preganglionic or postganglionic axons? Pre Post. No, I heard both. Which one's correct? Post. Post. So, of course, if it's postganglionic, myelinated or unmyelinated? Unmyelinated. Excellent. Into or out of the chain? Out of the chain. If it's going out of the chain, where's it going to? organs. Okay, and you get partial credit for internal organs. What are we Everything missing? Everything above the diaphragm. There you go. Internal organs above the diaphragm. Excellent. And we're halfway home. Give me another one. The splanchnic nerve. Excellent. Is the splanchnic nerve made of preganglionic or postganglionic neurons? Preganglionic. 
Does that mean they're myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelinated. Excellent. Into the chain or out of the chain? Out of the chain. And if it's out of the chain, where is it going to? Collateral. I like that. Collateral ganglia certainly is acceptable. Or we could also say uh, to the organs below the diaphragm, right? Because I know we get we, uh, directly to the collateral ganglia, but from there, the organs below the diaphragm. So both of those would be acceptable ways of describing that. Perfect. So that just leaves two. What are the two additional pathways into and out of the chain ganglia? Medulla vaginal gland. Not a bad guess, but remember, those go out the splenic nerve to get here as well. What do we know about chain ganglia? They go up and down. They connect to other chains, absolutely, other chain ganglia. So here above it, we would have the ascending chain. And down here, we would have the descending chain. Excellent. Now let's think about this. What type of axons are forming the ascending chain? Preganglionic. Yeah, well, if nothing else, you guys had a 50-50 shot to just guess. But rem absolutely remember when that uh, nerve, let's do it this way, when that axon comes in the white ramus, remember one of the things we said is that it could ascend or it could descend before it synapses. So absolutely. So let me go ahead and erase that because I don't want that confusion. Um, but, and I have to erase this because I stopped writing in the middle. Oops, nope. Ascending chain. And of course, if it's a preganglionic axon, is it myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelinated. So is it going into the chain or out of the chain? Into the chain? Out of this one, into another one. You guys are both absolutely correct. You're right. Some of those that came in the white ramus are going to go up and leave this chain to go to the one above it. But you're also right. Some of the axons from the one above could be coming down into this one as well. So in this case, it is going to have both into and out of the chain. And basically, it is going to or coming from other chain ganglia. And so guess what that tells us about the descending chain? You can only go out one it's, way. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, exactly. So both the ascending chain, because if you think about it, what's the, end, what's the ascending chain for this one is going to be the descending chain for the one above them. So they're both absolutely the same. They are both made up of preganglionic neurons that are, un that are myelinated, uh, going both to and from the chain ganglia. And that means they're going uh, to and from, to slash from, other chain ganglia. There you go. So in a way, this chain ganglia is our big hub where we have all these axons coming in and out of it. And by understanding how things leave this and where they go from there, it can kind of help us to understand our pathways. So would only pathway axons in pathway one and two use the ascending and descending chain because three and four leave from sympathetic or splatnic nerve? Uh, no. So, uh, yet, so yes, for the very first part, with one minor exception to what you said. You are correct. Uh, for pathways three and four, remember, it comes in the white ramus and immediately leaves the splanchnic nerve without, uh, without synapsing. 
and that is for both three and four. So you are correct. Uh, uh, the ascending uh, and descending chains are just going to be made by ones that either go up or go down, or ones that come in and go down, but ones that synapse here in the chain ganglia. And remember, once you synapse in the chain ganglia, then we have two choices. You can, that this postganglionic neuron can either go out the gray ramus to the skin, or it can go out the sympathetic nerve to the organs above the diaphragm. Okay, so pathways one and two, as long as they don't synapse in this original chain ganglion. Correct. And if they do synapse there, then they go out. Okay, got it, yeah. thank you. And remember, as we talked about, these pretty much do all of it. So I like that. If you want, it wouldn't be required for the exam, but if you wanted to be more specific, you're right. You could see the pre-ganglionic uh, neurons from pathways one and two. I, I wouldn't require that on the exam, but you are correct. Uh, it is only the ones that are one and two because those are the ones that synapse in the chain ganglia. Only the ones that synapse in the chain ganglia are going to either ascend or descend. So you are correct on that. Uh, and yes, the gray ramus and the sympathetic ramus are the only ones that are made up of postganglionic neurons. That is correct. Again, lateral thinking. This is just another way of digesting and making sense of this information. If we understand this information, then we can dissect it in this way. So we're not just memorizing and regurgitating information, we're actually truly learning. And that is our goal. All right. Questions on that? All righty. Whoops, wrong button. Uh, back to here. We did that, we did that, we did all that. Excellent. So again, now we have done all of these pathways and emphasize it. Again, notice ones that synapse in the chain, go to the heart, go to the lungs, salivary glands, skin, eyes. Those that pass through the chain go to things like the stomach, the pancreas, the liver. And notice again, all the way through without synapsing to the adrenal gland. So even the simple version does a good job of showing us our basic pathways. All right, now, as we've mentioned, uh, most organs uh, have dual innervation where they get input to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So while they start in different uh, locations, eventually they're gonna go to the heart or they're gonna go to the lungs or they're gonna go to the spleen. Uh, they kind of come together and form elaborate networks of nerves. And we've heard that term before. What's the fancy term we use for an elaborate network of nerves? A plexus. A plexus, absolutely. If you need a hint, it's right at the very top of the page. Absolutely, plexis, absolutely. And there are many of them. Much like the ganglia, they're often named by the major blood vessels they not lie next to because arteries and veins and, uh, bl and blood vessels, I mean, pardon me, arteries and veins and nerves all tend to travel together. Here I have a list of some of them. Here's a great picture. You don't have to memorize this list. I do really like this picture a lot though, because there are some things you can see. Notice here, we see the chain ganglion going down to the bottom. We don't quite see the ganglion in par where they come together, but we can see where that chain is then coming up the other side around there. Notice also, if you look closely, you can see our three collateral ganglia in the front. There is our celiac ganglion. Here is our superior mesenteric ganglion. And here is our inferior mesenteric ganglion. So right uh, in here, there we go. And we can see these elaborate plexes that are located in here, these elaborate networks of nerves kind of connecting them all together. Notice if we get the pesky person out of the way, we can see these things even more nicely, right? 
So again, still not quite seeing the ganglion and power it comes together, but we're seeing all of these things, these elaborate networks, and they have names. But the only one I'm going to hold you responsible for, because it's the one that you should be probably most familiar with, is this one right here. As it turns out, the superior mesenteric ganglion and the celiac ganglion all kind of come together into this big mass, which is known as the celiac plexus. This celiac plexus uh, has a couple things uh, going for it. One, it is also known as your fourth chakra. I remember your pineal gland up there is your first chakra, your third eye. Well, here we have our celiac plexus, uh, which is your uh, fourth chakra. Uh, but uh, you'll notice one other thing about it as well. And where is it on this picture? Oh, this picture doesn't show it. All right, I will cheat. Uh, the other name for the celiac plexus, if you haven't heard that one before, is you may have heard it referred to as the solar plexus. And one of the things you may know about the solar plexus is while it is made up of autonomic ganglia, we have all these autonomic ganglia that are going on here, there is also an additional nerve that travels all the way down from our cervical region of our body and comes down and becomes part of this plexus as well. And that additional nerve happens to be the phrenic nerve. And someone remind me again what that phrenic nerve does? Is that the one that innervates the diaphragm? Exactly. All right. And again, you may not have thought of it in the terms, you may not have thought of the phrenic nerve or how it's a part of the solar plexus, but if you sometimes may have received an unexpected blow right below the xiphoid process of your ribs, right below the diaphragm, that uh, disrupt that dramatic increase in internal pressure can disrupt the activity of the solar plexus, including disrupting the activity of the phrenic nerve. And if your phrenic nerve can't function, what can you not do? Breathe. Well, technically you can still breathe, but what you can't do is contract your diaphragm, All right? Luckily you have accessory muscles that are able to elevate the ribs or, or compress the ribs or things along those lines. So technically you still can get air in and out, but does it feel like you can get air in and out? No. No, what do we call that condition when that occurs? Getting the wind knocked out of you. Yeah, getting the wind knocked out of you, absolutely. That getting the wind knocked out of you is caused by this disruption of the celiac or what is also known as the solar plexus. So again, many of you have probably not thought about the autonomic nervous system or phrenic nerves or the celiac ganglion or any of those things, but you or someone you know has probably at one point or another had the wind knocked out of them where you feel like you're gonna die. You don't die, but you feel like you're gonna die. And that's because you've disrupted the ability of that phrenic nerve to do its job of contracting that diaphragm. Without the diaphragm, breathing gets a whole lot harder. So again, something very relevant, something very familiar. So it should be something that we easily understand. Questions on that? Um, so the celiac plexus and solar plexus are interchangeable and they're made up of the celiac ganglion and the superior mesenteric. Yeah, well, so the, all these nerves here kind of come together to form the solar plexus. The solar plexus is kind of the celiac and superior mesenteric together. Both have their own plexes. The superior mesenteric plexus is very small. Uh, primarily involved in innervation of the kidneys, but collectively this whole thing with that phrenic nerve coming down is what we refer to as the solar plexus. So it's kind of a combination of the two, but for, for our purposes, for most purposes, as you, uh, as people talk about it commonly, the term celiac ganglion and solar, uh, sorry, celiac plexus and solar plexus are pretty much used interchangeably. 
So yeah, so I have no okay. problem using them interchangeably as well. Thank you. Yep. All right, so here is the good news. The good news is we are mostly done with all of the new information you are responsible for. Pretty much almost everything else we're gonna talk about is going to at least involve things that we've already discussed. However, one of the things we are going to do is start adding a lot of vocabulary. So we're gonna talk about things we've done before, uh, add a little bit more detail and add a lot more vocabulary to this to make sure that we understand this information. So again, I think this remaining bit of information we have to cover isn't particularly hard, but because it can involve a lot of new vocabulary, again, I want to go ahead and take our last break uh, and to come back at this information fresh so that we are able to uh, uh, get through this uh, with some hopefully semblance of understanding. So it is, looks like it's 2.06 now. So let's go ahead, we'll call it 2.05, take a 15 minute break, come back at 2.20 and at 2.20 we will restart and hopefully finish off the rest of the information we are responsible for. And I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take one more break? Yes, everything we're talking about right now is gonna be on your fifth exam, that is correct. Even this, uh, this vocabulary we're gonna talk about right now will be on the exam too, okay. Absolutely, which is why we're talking about it right now. Absolutely, everything we talk about today is going to be on the exam, yep. All right, excellent. See you guys in 15 minutes. Let's, let's finish 4.30 off. All righty, so. As we have talked about, uh, again, many times in this class, we know that we have neurons and those neurons release neurotransmitter and our target cells have to have a receptor for that neuron to be able to bind to, right? These are not new concepts. These are things that, that we have identified and talked about before, many times all the way back to the muscular system. So now we're gonna start adding some labels to it. We know that there are some types of neurons that release acetylcholine. And a neuron that releases acetylcholine, because it releases acetylcholine, we give it a fancy name. We say it is a cholinergic neuron. Big fancy term, but all that basically means is that it is a neuron that releases acetylcholine. Now, the tricky is not the right term, but as we start processing information and making sense of it, what neurons that we have identified in this class are cholinergic? Preganglionic neuron. Excellent. And notice uh, you're absolutely correct, all uh, preganglionic neurons. Oops. Uh, that means both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Release acetylcholine. Excellent. What other ones? The neuromuscular junction. Yeah, so at the neuromuscular junction, remember those are somatic motor neurons. So all somatic motor neurons that communicate with our skeletal muscle, those are all cholinergic, excellent. Well, you guys said all the preganglionic, what about our postganglionic neurons? Do any of those release acetylcholine? The uh, adrenal gland, the, what am I thinking of? So someone help her out. Which postganglionic neurons release 
acetylcholine. The ones in the fourth? No, these are. Do they release acetylcholine? I don't know. Are there any that release acetylcholine? Well, I'm asking the question. So, what should the obvious answer be? It has to be yes. Is it maybe in the parasympathetic? Because the fourth one, it's the preganglionic one that releases acetylcholine in the medulla of the adrenal gland. But so it must be in the parasympathetic, but I can't remember what it is. All of them. All of the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons release acetylcholine. And if you remember in the sympathetic pathway, we said most release norepinephrine, but there are a few sympathetic postganglionic neurons that release acetylcholine as well. Again, remember we said acetylcholine was the most common neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, I mean the peripheral nervous system. So it's not surprisingly that most of the neurons involved release acetylcholine. So again, all of our autonomic preganglionic neurons, both sympathetic and, and para, all parasympathetic postganglionic neurons, oops. Not sure why both of those things are coming up. Only some, uh, specifically the ones that are going to the sweat glands, the ones that are going to the skeletal muscle and to the brain, blood vessels to the skeletal muscle of the brain. Those locations, they release acetylcholine. And like we talked about, all somatic motor neurons. So again, we already knew that all these neurons released acetylcholine because we've talked about it all of the time. I guess the only real specific thing, we knew that some released, we didn't say which ones, now we know which ones. Uh, but we've now given a name to them. We've called them cholinergic neurons. All right, so again, really not new information here. We're just kind of uh, rehashing information we've already known and kind of synthesizing it and adding some vocabulary, adding some labels. Let's talk about something else we knew. And that is that a cell, a target cell, that has a receptor on it, that acetylcholine can bind to, is a cholinergic receptor. Now, if you remember way back in the day, one of the things we were talking about is how acetylcholine on skeletal muscle, we said was excitatory because we said it opened those cation channels that let the sodium in. Yes, it allows a little bit of potassium out as well, but mostly it's letting that sodium in and that was what gave it that depolarization and that's what made it excitatory. But remember, we also mentioned that if you sprinkle a little acetylcholine on cardiac muscle, it was actually inhibitory. It slowed the heart rate down and that's because it actually opens up chloride channels. And so chloride enters the cell Chloride is, of course, negative, and that makes the cell more negative. That should be an indication that while both purple here and red here are uh, both channels that acetylcholine can bind to, there are, in fact, two different types of acetylcholine receptors or cholinergic receptors, purple and red. Of course, are they really purple and red in real life? No. No. So it would be really easy, it would be really nice if for one of them they labeled it A and for the other one they labeled it B. That would be really nice. But we know anatomists, did they do such a thing? Oh, they hate us. No, exactly. They hate you, absolutely. However, 
while both of these channels are channels that acetylcholine can bind to, there are in fact small differences in the channels. And the way that they figured this out is by using toxins. As we know, toxins are chemicals that can kind of mimic the effect of the neurotransmitter, where toxin A here can actually bind to this receptor and activate it, but toxin A cannot bind to B. However, there is a toxin B that can bind to the second receptor and can't bind to the first receptor. So notice, while they're both channels that acetylcholine can bind to, there are two different toxins that can only bind to one type of receptor. And so what they decided to do was name these receptors after the toxins. Now, of course, are the toxins named toxin A and toxin B? No. no, but one of them is a toxin you are definitely aware of. Where does nicotine come from? Cigarettes? Yeah, or specifically tobacco, absolutely. So for one of these channels, nicotine is the toxin that binds to it. So they call it a nicotinic receptor. The other cholinergic receptor, a toxin called muscarin. Muscarin, remember I was talking about those magic mushrooms that uh, my former student's uh, boyfriend would eat all the time. Okay, by magic, I don't mean magic like the ones that give you hallucinations. I mean the poisonous mushrooms. Uh, those poisonous mushrooms uh, that he would eat uh, that would make him sick and they had to call the EMT. Muscarin is one of the toxins that can be found in there. Uh, certain poisonous frogs uh, that ironically are also sometimes licked for uh, hallucinogenic factors or things along those lines are things, it's true. I wish it wasn't true, but it is true. Uh, so muscarin is another toxin from frogs, from mushrooms, things along those lines uh, that can bind to uh, this B receptor. And so they call it a muscarinic. So yes, A and B would be more convenient, but instead they named them by the toxins that bind to them. And not surprisingly, these are found in different parts of the body. So those nicotinic receptors that respond to nicotine, these are ones that are always excitatory. So if you think about things that are always excitatory, our skeletal muscle is always excitatory. Our postsynaptic, uh, pardon me, postganglionic ANS neurons are always excited by acetylcholine. So these are the kind of places where you find these nicotinic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are more complicated. Some of them are excitatory and some of them are inhibitory. And these are mostly found in our parasympathetic nervous system effectors and our sweat glands. So let's go back to the boyfriend. As I mentioned, he eats that poisonous mushroom and as we talked about, it causes him to cry, it increases his mucus production, it decreases his airways, it decreases his heart rate, it decreases his pupils, and he starts sweating all over the place as a result of it. Because that poisonous mushroom toxin is binding to all these muscarinic receptors, and he's sweating and drooling and crying, and right, heart rate's decreasing, having trouble breathing, three times in a year. Again, they must be incredibly delicious mushrooms. All right. So hopefully, again, 
not a tremendous, uh, yes, absolutely. In a, in a large enough dose, muscarin absolutely can kill you. Yep. What would they do when the paramedics came to fix that? Uh, it's a great question. My guess is one of the first things they would probably do is get uh, hit them with an EpiPen. Because as we know, with that autonomic tone, we're having this massive parasympathetic uh, activation because of this toxin. So if we could uh, add adrenaline to a system, that epinephrine to a system, we might be able to uh, combat some of those things. It dries up the mucous membranes. It increases heart rate. It uh, in opens up the airways. So my guess is that they would probably start with something like that. Uh, and then I don't know what else they would do to detoxify the blood. I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, Yuli, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question to you. I'm not sure if this is related to um, nervous system or not, but I know that some substances bind irreversibly in our bodies and like lead is one of them. So what happens when you catch someone being poisoned? I mean, you can give them some drug that will bind to the lead, but what happens to the already bound lead? Like, okay. is there any way to flush it out? Yes. So you have the right idea and, uh, Lead's a good example. Carbon monoxide is another great example. It's not that these things bind and completely won't let go. What happens though is they do bind very strongly. What we say is they have a higher affinity, which means that like for instance, carbon monoxide likes to bind to our hemoglobin and does not like to let go. So if we're going to help somebody with carbon monoxide poisoning, what we need to do is put them in a hyperbaric chamber, uh, flood it with a lot of really rich oxygen so that we can force a lot of oxygen, more oxygen than normal into the blood. And with all that oxygen into the blood, it is finally able to compete against that, against that carbon monoxide, get that carbon monoxide to let go and bind to it. So yes, we just have to find ways to either lessen the hold that it has on that receptor or find a way to get something that's you know, healthy to outcompete it. So yes, yeah, so it's not like they lock on there and never let go. It's just, they really don't like to let go. And so it can be hard to get them to, uh, to release, but there, there are ways to get them to do that. I, Daniel, I don't know enough about the story. Again, I don't, I don't know if morels or mushrooms that they have up in Tahoe. I'm not as familiar with the uh, 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 plant life there. Plants are relatively pointless. Uh, again, they're not humans. It's not anatomy and physiology, so I don't care about it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I don't I don't know the in depth of the stories of, of, of this. I just know that it happened, like I said, three times in the time she was in my class. So, yep. All right, excellent. So those are our cholinergic neurons and our cholinergic receptors. And guess what? We have names for things. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why she's doing it is so that she can, uh, she can write a book, maybe. So a neuron that releases a, a norepinephrine, we call an adrenergic neuron. And if you think about it, there's really one main adrenergic neuron that we've talked about in this class, and that is most of our sympathetic postganglionic neurons. So these are the ones that talk to are sympathetic effectors, or most. Most of our sympathetic effectors, right? Not the skin, not the blood vessels to the muscles, things along those lines, but pretty much everything else. All right, so that one's pretty simple, pretty easy, pretty straightforward, not a whole heck of a lot to that. Just adding a new label to a neuron we already knew. Where things get a little bit more interesting is with the adrenergic receptors. Once again, we know a cell that has a receptor that norepinephrine can bind to, we call it 
an adrenergic receptor. But once again, there are two classes. And remember how convenient we said it would be if they called them A and B? Well, they almost did that for us here. Of course, being anatomists that hate us, they couldn't get away with something as simple as A and B. So instead they went Greek. They went alpha and beta. So there are two main classes of adrenergic receptors, but it can't be quite that easy either. So as it turns out, there are two specific types of alphas and there are three specific types of betas. So five total different types of adrenergic receptors. So for these five specific types, we need to know the effects and where they're found. So let's do that. Let's go through those and figure it out. As I mentioned, there are two alphas, alpha one and alpha two. Alpha one is our most common type of adrenergic receptor. So if you randomly reach into the body and pull out an adrenergic receptor, it is most likely gonna be a one, alpha one. Alpha ones are always excitatory. These are the ones that stimulate the blood vessels, the smooth muscle of our blood vessels. These are the ones that stimulate uh, our digestive system, our mucous membranes of our nose, things along those lines. And alpha two are the ones that decrease metabolic activity. So these are the ones, for instance, that, uh, oops, go to uh, the um, salivary glands. Uh, these are the ones that go to uh, the digestive system, also to the digestive system, to the digestive glands, like the salivary glands, like the stomach, like the small intestine. All right, these might be new. These might be things you haven't heard of before, but I know you've heard of this even if you don't know that you've heard of this, because let's talk a little bit about our betas, starting first with beta one. Beta one is excitatory and is almost exclusively found on the heart. Now, why might you be aware of that? People who take um, like beta blockers. Bingo. When you come home from the grocery store and you have your three bags of groceries and you have to walk up those two flights of stairs to get to your apartment, as you're lugging those groceries up those stairs, your sympathetic nervous system releases that norepinephrine and it tells your heart to beat stronger, to beat faster so that you can get more blood to your muscles so you can get those groceries to your apartment, which is important and awesome and great unless you already have high blood pressure, unless you've just had heart surgery. If you've just had heart surgery, every time you get up and walk around, do you necessarily want your heart beating stronger and faster? No. So what do you do? You take a beta blocker. So now when your neurons release that norepinephrine, when your adrenaline is released from your uh, adrenal gland, right? It can't bind to the beta receptors on your heart and your heart st rate stays slow, stays level, your blood pressure stays low and level. So those beta blockers help to maintain, right? Uh, to eliminate that effect 
of that sympathetic nervous system on the heart. Okay. Beta twos, relax the smooth muscle, primarily in your respiratory system. As I mentioned, this right here is why everywhere I go with little, I carry an EpiPen. Because as I mentioned, little has a severe peanut and tree nut allergy. If she gets has is exposed to a nut allergen, she has the potential to go into an anaphylactic shock where she gets massive vasodilation of her blood vessels, dropping her blood pressure, increase in mucus uh, production of her airways, decreasing her airways. So what do I do? I carry that EpiPen so I can jab her in the leg, bringing her heart rate up, making her heart beat stronger, making her heart beat faster, bringing up that blood pressure to get that blood to the brain dilating the smooth muscle of the respiratory system so we can get that air into her lungs, all right? Hopefully allowing her to survive, all right? This is what it's about, that adrenaline binding to these beta receptors, helping us to survive. Vitally, vitally important. Understanding how they work is vitally important as well. However, probably the most interesting, the most studied of all of the receptors right now are the beta threes. Beta three receptors, as they found out, are found in adipose and they play a very important role in increasing our metabolism, increasing our body temperature and helping in the breakdown of lipids right, so that we more easily digest lipids to get energy instead of carbohydrates. Why is so much energy and resources going into study these beta threes? Because as we all know, the most important thing in the whole wide world is to look beautiful. And why bother going to the gym to look beautiful if there's a pill that you could take that would stimulate your beta three receptors, increasing your metabolism, causing your felt to just your fat to just melt off you while you sat on the couch and watch TV. Right? Who would go to the gym anymore if you could just pop a pill? Right? Because as we, you know, as we all know, it's not on the inside what counts; it's only on the outside that counts. So, not surprisingly, pharmaceutical companies, researchers spending millions of dollars studying these beta threes, trying to get a better understanding of them so that they can all become rich. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. I'll pretend that that makes sense. Excellent, your book's got a nice table, talks about these types of receptors and where they're found in the body and what their effect is. So it's a good way to review this information. All right, the last thing we need to talk about, again, it's a concept that is not new to us, but we're adding a new label, right? As we've mentioned from way back, even when we were talking about the muscular system and stuff, and we were talking about it earlier today, we know that there are chemicals slash toxins that can bind to receptors. And when they bind to those receptors, they can have one of two effects. One effect, like we've talked about, of putting the gum in the keyhole, they can bind to and block the receptor so it cannot be used. Or it can bind to and activate the receptor. So it mimics the effects. All right? We talked about both of these when we were talking about the uh, muscle system. Remember, we talked about how, for instance, Karari binds to the receptors and blocks it, causing that flaccid paralysis. Whereas we talked about how tetanus binds and activates, causing that rigid paralysis, that locked jaw we talked about. So notice this isn't a new concept we have talked about. The only difference 
is now we're adding labels to it. A chemical or toxin that binds to a receptor and blocks it, we call an agonist. And a chemical or toxin that binds to a receptor and mimics the effect, we call an antagonist. Nope, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. A receptor that binds and activates it. I wrote it down wrong, I wasn't thinking. An agonist, I'm sorry, binds and activates. So a receptor binds and activates. Here, let's go back. There we go for clarification. So excellent. If it binds and activates the receptor, I wasn't even thinking while I was talking. Binds and activates is an agonist, binds and blocks is an antagonist. All right, so let's talk about some examples. Again, you may not have heard of these terms before, but most of you are aware of these things because for instance, many of you have taken cold medicines before. When do you take a cold medicine? When I am, you have a cold. There you go, I was gonna say, I am speaking out loud, right? Okay, yeah, try. But why would you take it if you're having a cold? What are the symptoms that you have that you're hoping to eliminate? So you can sleep at night and breathe through your nose. Excellent. You've got a congested nose. Maybe you have sinus pain because of the congestion of mucus in there as well. You've got a runny nose. You've got a cough, all of those things. So when you take that cold medicine, basically remember our alpha-1 receptors are the ones that excite the smooth muscle. So what ends up happening is they constrict the blood vessels going to your nasal cavity. And if less, go, less blood goes to your nasal cavity, guess what happens to your mucus production? Decreases. It yeah, decreases, exactly, right? Now less blood flow, the airways open up, there's less mucus. It increases the blood pressure, which often helps us to feel better. It causes the pupils to dilate, right? Because it's basically stimulating that sympathetic response. Nicotine, right? Think back to your first cigarette. There you were, seven-year-old, grabbing a smoke out of your dad's pocket, right? Running out into the backyard so that you could have a smoke, right? And you got all jittery as a result of it. Right, maybe you got a little nauseous and threw up as a result of it. Never tried? Oh, you absolutely have to. It's the best. No, just kidding. Don't try it. So, but it, uh, so if you think about the things nicotine does, it causes epinephrine to be released. It's an, it stimulates, it activates, it, it uh, releases dopamine, which is, especially in the insula, which is what leads to the addiction that is associated with it, right? It stimulates the, uh, the skeletal muscle. So you feel jittery especially the first time you have it, right? So you get this big, huge stimulation, activation, and uh, this increase of dopamine, which makes us like it for some reason. And uh, again, becomes very, very addictive that way. Conversely, antagonists, as we talk about, bind and block. Right? Atropine is a muscarinic uh, 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 blocker. Remember, that's for the parasympathetic nervous system. And it blocks the parasympathetic input into the iris. This is what those horrible, horrible people we refer to as optometrists use, right? I mean, they're not quite chemists, but they're pretty bad. Most optometrists uh, only have uh, eye appointments at noon on sunny days and they sit you in the chair and then they put those drops in your eye. Why do they put those drops in your eye? Something like atropine? Because what it does is it blocks the parasympathetic input so that when they shine that light in your eye, normally your iris would try to close to protect it, but because they've blocked that, your pupil blows up nice and big because they're too lazy to turn to left and right when they're looking in your eyeball so they can just sit still and look in there because they're so lazy and anybody ever tried to read their watch after getting those eye drops put in their eye or read a book 
after getting an eye exam? Yeah, it's blurry. Right, because not only does it block the signals to your pupil that change the diameter of it, but it also blocks the signals that change the focus of your lens. So you're not able to focus up close. You can only see things from a distance, right? All because they're too lazy to eat in left and right. Horrible, horrible people, right? And then of course they have to embarrass you by giving you those horrible plastic wrap around sunglasses as they kick you out of their office in a bright sunny day, right? Horrible, horrible people. Excellent. So, but again, many of you have experienced that. And so again, you have that idea and it lasts for you know, three or four days before it finally goes away. No, a couple hours. Excellent. And we already, for instance, talked about the beta blockers as well. Those heart medicines that again, stop the sympathetic nervous system from increasing heart rate, increasing blood pressure to protect the heart. All right, so again, most of these are things we've experienced. Most of these are things we've been talking about from the beginning. We've just kind of added some labels like cholinergic, adrenergic, you know, antagonist, agonist, just kind of consolidated information we've learned over the semester and put it all together. And again, your book's got a nice table that doesn't just talk on the receptors, but also talks about their agonists and antagonists as well. And there you go. Just that simply, we have covered everything you are going to be responsible for on the last exam and everything you are responsible for in Biology 430. All right. Questions on that? One word, just wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's been, like I said, in, it, as I said at the very beginning, in, in some ways, this semester has felt like it has just raced by, and in some ways, it feels like we have been online for absolutely ever. So it's an incredibly weird, uh, unique experience that I'm sure many years we'll, we'll look back at and laugh on. But as we are going through it right now, uh, it is a surreal experience to be, to be learning in this kind of environment and dealing with this thing in this kind of environment. So... I'm hoping one day we'll look back at this and laugh, but uh, it's been, it, it's, it's not intuitive. It's not the way this class is supposed to be run. We've done the best that we can with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it has been absolutely surreal. So hopefully you have gained something from this. Hopefully you can be successful in the remaining eight classes. And hopefully as you move forward onto 431, uh, you will be able to be successful as well. Again, from here, we don't meet again. Uh, I've got office hours. You can email me. I can meet outside of those normal office hours. I'll try to hold office hours at the beginning of uh, the first couple hours of class on, um, uh, what is that going to be, the 13th uh, for something like that. But for the most part, unless you have problems with the exam, which hopefully you won't have, this is it. So I want to thank you all uh, for uh, putting up with this class. Again, like I said, I know it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for me as well. And we've gotten through this the best as we can. I wish you great success uh, moving forward, uh, wherever you go from here. If from here you go to 431 with me, I want you to take a good day or two off. And then after that, I want you diving right into the cardiovascular system, because that is what we will be doing in 431 if you have me for 431. So take a good two days off. Uh, see your family, see your, you know, your kids uh, yell at people outside your house and then get back right to the books. All righty. No singing for extra credit. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, it has been a joy. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, so great question. So, yes. No, hold on. let's not say goodbye yet. So, yes. First, I will answer questions for you. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff has a, a open lab tomorrow. And I think if you check with him, he might have open lab. What would that be? I know he has it tomorrow. He might have it on the 14th as well, because that's during the middle of finals week. I know he's done it in the past, uh, but with us being online, uh, normal, so normally he's there doing, uh, during finals week, but I don't know about with the online. My guess is that he will be, but I don't know that for certain. Uh, and then again, after the final open labs is when he will, uh, uh, he'll get those hours to me so that I can get that put into the into the grade book. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I have questions about the exam. Yes. Uh, for the brain, um, how much do uh, you want us to know? Just the areas and the function of them, or uh, like what? Mm, 
what uh, damage of that area, what effect will that have? Um, no, so a great question. So, I mean, the two kind of go hand in hand. Yes, absolutely. You need to on the exam, for instance, be able to, if I point an arrow at the, uh, the primary motor cortex, you need to recognize that that's a primary motor cortex and that it is responsible for the contralateral control of skeletal muscle, right? So you're right. If I flip that around like on a, on a multiple choice question and asked damage to what area would allow you to not move your right arm or something like that, then yeah, that should hopefully be something that, that you should be able to do it next uh, back and forth. I made a point of emphasizing a lot of the deficiencies as we went through these things, because I think seeing how it breaks down is really how we've learned about much of the ways that how the brain works. Like I said, one of the greatest things that happened in the field of neuroscience is the development of helmets. Because before helmets, young men went away to war and died. After helmets, young men came back from war brain damaged. And so when they had certain areas of their brain that were damaged, neuroscientists were able to look at and see what they could and could not do. And as a result of that, uh, we were able to determine, ah, this part of the brain is where they see, because when it gets blown off by a, you know, by a cannonball, that person can't see anymore. When Phineas Gage had his frontal lobe destroyed, right, we learned that that's where your personality and behavior are. So uh, the two kind of go hand in hand. But I mean, I, 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 I see for the lab exam, it's going to be much more, what is this area? What does it do? In okay. the for the lecture exam, could we get more of like how the misfunctions would occur, something like that? Sure. But for the lab exam, it's going to be what is this area and what does it do? Yeah, because some of the areas had similar functions, such as the uh, proprioception. I saw that in the inferior, superior col uh, colliculi or in the o uh, o olive in medulla. So, you've got the right idea. Remember, the olive is just for proprioception. The superior colliculus and inferior colliculus is where we take vision and proprioception and put it together in the superior colliculus and where we put hearing and proprioception together in the inferior colliculus. So okay. hearing is in the temporal lobe, vision is in the occipital lobe, right? The olive is proprioception and the corpora quadrumina, the superior and inferior colliculi is where we put those three things together. Okay. Yeah. And one last question. I was trying to figure out what uh, effect will have if we damage the um, auditory association area. Was that the example of the glove you told us or that was the... So for auditory, auditory is where we make sense of auditory information. So basically if that area was damaged, you would be able to hear sound. So like for instance, they put the earphones on you and they said, raise your hand when you hear a sound, you would be able to do that but you wouldn't be able to differentiate sounds. You would have difficulty telling the difference of different tones or whether it was ascending or descending or getting louder or, or, short, or, or, or being able to recognize the sound like, you know, like, uh, like, a, like, a, uh, like a siren or like a lion's roar or something along those lines. And for the primary, it will just be deafness? Uh... Yeah, for, yeah, exactly. You would not be able to perceive sound at all. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question about our homework assignment that we just had to turn in uh, yes. today. Yeah, I got your um, email. Did you not get mine back? Me? Uh, somebody somebody had a problem oh, with the me. email and sent me any, a question about that. And I thought I responded. Maybe it was somebody else. What was your question? It was about the, the first thing, the model diagram and the structures identified. Okay. That didn't make so, sense at all. Right, because if you looked at that, that's actually procedure one, and you only had to do procedure two. Oh, so we didn't have to do that? No, you just had to do procedure two. Oh. It was on the same page, oh, okay. but sense. it was, just, yeah. No, again, that first procedure was something that um, if you're in the classroom and you have the models, you're looking at the models, you're finding the nerves on the models, you're doing all those things, and that's all this stuff. Yeah, I, again, I specifically on the description and on the explanation said you only had to do procedure two. So yeah, so just starting on, on procedure two, which was the, the cranial nerve activity, you didn't have to do the first part of that. I mean, you could, there was nothing wrong with it. If you had a models or pictures and you wanted to go through and identify those things, that's fine, but that wasn't the assignment. The assignment were just a procedure two. 
Uh, I would have slept for an extra 30 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Well, make it up tonight. Uh, look, it, it's the perfect example of FSN many times on exams. People often lose uh, points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully, right? The descriptions, the, 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 the description of the assignment specifically said procedural too. And you weren't the only one who had the problem with that. I know other people did as well. And as you can see from the comments in the chat, uh, other, many people who haven't contacted me had that problem with it as well. Again, I specifically said procedure two, fine procedure two. So again, you didn't do anything wrong. It, you're certainly not the only one who did that. Um, yeah, but see, uh, yeah, and again, a lot of people just saw the page numbers. And so I apologize if that was confusing. That wasn't my goal. I tried to be specific about what I wanted you to do. But as long as you did the other stuff, then that's all that matter. Cool. Yeah, again, some of those things are really fun. And again, I, uh, I know you weren't able to do all the tests at home, because like I said, many of you probably didn't have tuning forks and stuff like that. But hopefully you're at least able to do some of those activities and had some fun doing that. And if not, well, at least it's done and you get points for it. All right. Any other questions? Wait, I'm looking back at the um, the homework thing. It doesn't spe specifically say it's the procedure two. Or just say it somewhere else. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about the um, your description in um, on Canvas. Oh, uh, I don't know about the one on Canvas, but I know every day in class when I've been putting the schedule up, I know I've specifically been saying that. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in lecture every day I've been saying that. Although if it's not in the uh, description, it should be. Hmm. Well, I'll look that up. Any other questions? Oh, you're right. It doesn't say that on the description. So let me go ahead and fix that for the next class. But I know every day in class when I've been talking about it. Yeah. But that's like the last homework time we're going to have, right? I can give you more if you really want, but uh, uh, extra credit, maybe. I'll do it. <laughs> no, you don't want to do more homework, and more importantly, I don't want to grade more homework. So uh, I think we're good that way. Okay, excellent. So yes, I fixed it on the canvas. Thank you for pointing out that that was uh, not uh, specific on there. So I fixed that so that it won't be a problem in the future, but. Uh, I know I've been writing it on the descriptions uh, for the daily uh, logs. All righty. Well, the extra credit, you get, you're already getting a participation uh, grade for that, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, again, everybody who's here is definitely getting that. And then uh, participation points are not extra credit points. Remember, that is a grade. So you're getting 15 out of 15 for being here, being active in the learning process. So it's not extra credit, but it is, it's still, it's like, you know, one and a half homework assignments that you're getting free, the free points just for being active in the learning process. And obviously everybody who's here is getting that. All right, uh, while well, I was looking that up, did I miss any other questions? It looks like that was anything. All right, any other questions? All righty, then excellent. Uh, and you guys have uh, an excellent weekend. Study hard this weekend. Uh, good luck on your exams and uh, uh, good, rec good luck uh, on the final as well. So like I said, if you need anything, please contact me by email, come to my office hours. Uh, and uh, if I do not see you again, uh, which again, uh, hopefully there won't be any problems with the exams. Again, knock on wood. I wish you all great success moving forward in your academic careers. And yes, for some of you, definitely, I look forward to see you in 431. Take two days off. Cardiovascular system. Start with the heart. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah.